Uh, once a digital problem goes wrong, then you need three people or four uh, to fix it. So thank you for your patience and welcome to um, the next panel that uh, I have the honor to moderate. Thank you, Klaas and Caro, for the invitation. Banks becoming superfluous. Banks' fears of being commoditized. That's um, the panel topic. And we have uh, three speakers with a very diverse background. And um, I welcome Jana Koch of Comdirect Bank, the local con uh, competitor, so to speak, here, and a uh, member of the sort of traditional uh, sector, but well, very digital. Uh, Philip Bushman, uh, founder and uh, CEO of uh, Azure. Uh, based in Berlin, right? And uh, Jeroen, he is uh, from, uh, I think, the founder of FinSoc and uh, came to us from Amsterdam. And he will start with his presentation on the topic of banks' fears. Perfect. Uh, okay. Perfect. So, welcome you all. Pleasure of having you here in the, in the room. Today I will share briefly some of uh, our views on the future of, uh, of banking. For those who, of, of you who don't uh, know me, uh, I'm the founder of uh, Finco. Um, I have a background in uh, strategy consulting and specialized in retail banking and payments uh, innovation. Um, Finco is a strategy consulting company specialized in uh, fintech. Uh, so what we do uh, in short is we help banks to understand uh, the world of fintech, what does the future of banking look like, and based on that help them develop their future strategy and propositions and also build uh, the bank of the future. And as Michael said, we're based in Amsterdam, but we work for banks across uh, Europe basically. Um, so enough uh, about me. Uh, let's look at the topic for today. Um, yeah, the, the future of banking, it's a big, big topic. Um, but overall, there are, there are a few major trends impacting the future of banking. First of all, there are, there are four structural uh, trends. Um, and we have uh, changing customer behavior. There are digital, digital native, expecting everything on demand. And they're more critical and expecting better service. Uh, there's ever um, ongoing technological advances uh, with new new innovations uh, there, especially now around open banking and data. Uh, there's new competition from all sorts of new players. Um, there's increasing regulatory complexity, yeah, tighter supervision, ever uh, bigger fines and such. And also in the market now, some cyclical trends, at least here in, in Europe, the market is stagnating, low interest rates. Um, and also we see, at least in Western Europe, the population is, uh, is aging. Um, this is just in a nutshell the main trends today. I just want to briefly share our views on uh, technology and also new, uh, new competition. What we see, first of all, is um, banks face increasing competition from uh, fintechs and also challenger banks. Uh, they are digital native and they, they focus on a very specific segment. Uh, and thereby they are, they are able to offer a much better proposition than uh, most of the incumbent banks. A better customer experience, more efficient, uh, operating faster, cheaper, and also uh, more inclusive, um, yeah, opening up to segments uh, not addressed uh, before. In addition to that, we have the, the big techs. Uh, well, what they do is they, 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 um, yeah, they, they want to focus on ever larger ecosystem and be as relevant as possible in order to, for example, uh, offer seamless transactions on their, their platform. Um, they, they are heavily active in payments. That's where they, uh, you see the most activity, but also they are greatly expanding into other segments of, uh, of banking. And in, in addition to that, um, the market is changing. There, there's a rise of open banking all across the, uh, across the world. Of course, UK is, is setting the example. They are uh, furthest ahead on, on the globe uh, with open banking. Uh, in Europe also we have PC2 that's uh, uh, steadily coming, uh, coming to life. And all across the world, uh, regulators are looking into open banking. And also the market players themselves are looking into open banking. 
And what, what this all means is it puts the traditional role of banks under pressure. At the, at the left, what you see is sort of the, the traditional bank. They have their own customer that they serve and they're active through, throughout the whole value chain. They, they offer the front ends um, where they service the, the, the customer with uh, digital channels via their branches, etc. They, they manage all the operations and all the networks and also they're active in the back end with financing uh, and risk. But what you see is at the, at the left hand side you have neo banks um, really competing with, with the banks um, and increasing uh, competition and taking over market share. Uh, in addition to that, you have all the fintechs either active throughout the whole value chain or just in specific segments attacking from the side. Individually, they're not, uh, I would say, typically not like a big, big competition, but adding up all the specific players targeting very specific niches. They also have our serious competition. And then you have the big techs, and that's an interesting uh, development. What you see is that they sort of position themselves as a platform between the customer and the banks, uh, thereby disintermediating the banks um, and yeah, uh, reducing the position of banks. And then what you have, have in the market with open banking, it becomes ever more easier for non-financial players to yeah, position themselves between between banks and the customer and also leverage their, their networks. And that really puts the, the, the position of banks under pressure. At the front end, you can question, can they compete with the customer experience that, uh, that others are offering? Also, at uh, operations, um, you have parties, for example, mortgage processing that, that work 10 times more cheaper than traditional banks or in SME lending where we've done a few projects. Uh, you have all these new players eh, offering a loan within one day versus traditional banks that take six weeks, eight weeks, and at uh, five, six times more cost to actually make a loan. So there they also are in a difficult position. You can, you can, you can argue finance and risk as sort of uh, money management is where they, they have, uh, that, that's their core and where they have the strongest position. But also there you see alternative uh, players um, and competing uh, with banks. And overall, uh, I believe that because it's more difficult to um, and maintain your competitive position along the whole chain, that you should specialize on certain activities. There, 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 there are uh, various roles that that you can uh, take as a bank. And these rule, roles um, are aligned to the to the parts in the value chain. First of all, you can, you could, for example, take the the front end, be an aggregator of financial services, where you offer a great customer experience and also sort of a marketplace for other uh, financial service uh, uh, providers. And what's really important there is, first of all the size of, of your network that you, you are available to many customers and many, many um, financial service providers and also the quality of your service. Um, and do you offer a good experience or not? Second one is the infrastructure or sort of the pipelines as they are often referred to of, uh, of the industry. Um, that's really about having the, the biggest and the best network. It, and f f to a very large part, it's about scale. Just having the biggest, uh, biggest network, thereby operate efficiently. Uh, third network is sort of, uh, third role is that of actually the, the core role of banks of being a financial solution provider. Uh, I had the icon of a factory, that's how I see it. Really a product factory, really just producing products. It's about the, the price of the product and the quality in terms and conditions and such that makes people choose your product or not. And that requires scale, having sufficient scale and also good, and good expertise. And the last role is that of a full service bank. It's in essence what, what banks do nowadays, um, but more up-to-date, more competitive. Um, as you can hear from my story, I question, is it um, sustainable in the long term? Can you be really strong on all parts of the value chain? Or yeah, should you rather uh, focus? Um, this is sort of a long-term view for the, for the long term, um, where it's really...
Extreme really one specific role. Uh, of course, also uh, there are hybrid solutions possible where you sort of mix mix roles, and um, uh, in, in in the short term also you you can think of um, some mixed mixed solutions um, where to the customer you offer the full ends of services, but maybe you partner with fintechs, you insource solutions, and also strengthening uh, your, your core. But I think at least banks should think about this um, because they're really under pressure. And I think at the moment they're they're still still okay, but you know there come some moments where. It's been been too far, and then banks are re in a really difficult position. And I think they should think about their position now before uh, before it's too late. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, good morning, Hamburg. Um, while this presentation is being put up, we are asking here a question about the future. And uh, by asking a question about the future, I think it's always a very difficult one. And in my talk, I'm going to try to do two or three things. One is I'm going to try to zoom out completely to answer this question. And then I'm going to give you some evidence of what we see as Azure as a startup in the open banking space. I will talk about what we do in a little bit. Um, and then I think I'll give you a simple conclusion that's pretty much defines the vision of, of, the, uh, of our company that, that I'm building. So let's imagine these are two realities here. I don't know, for those people who like Black Mirror, there is an episode uh, where the bank is a number that's with you wherever you go. It doesn't have a brand. It's 15 million credits. It's an excellent show. And in this show, whatever you do, whether you walk into a store or whether you work out or whatever you consume, there's just a number, and that's your bank balance. And that's one way the bank becomes completely superfluous. In that world, you only have some credits and you're completely devoid of any kind of brand and any kind of bank. In the other world, there's a hyper-reality. This is a vision of the future that was presented um, on a Vimeo clip of 15 minutes where people are basically in a world where the brands are everywhere. They are in the shops, they constantly market to you, they constantly optimize you, this is in your vision, this is in your, in your glasses. And both of those worlds seem to me, at least from the outset, pretty reasonable ideas of what the future could look like, but they'd have very big different implications. All right, let's take a step back. I think this is the general evolution of any kind of product. I'm going to start with food, because we all understand that. Originally, we went out, gathered and hunted for some food. Then eventually, we decided that maybe we could trade for that food. Then we started farming and optimizing on this food. And then there was the first tavern in the town square. So where you no longer had to hunt for it, now you could actually go somewhere to get that done. Then all of a sudden we had an optimization of this, where we now had Italian, we had French, we had all of those different kinds of, of, of cuisine. And if we go into the evolution of the food story, I think the latest restaurants are actually trying to sell you an experience. You go in there because you want to feel included. Uh, there are some great restaurants in Amsterdam where I can tell you, you go in and you, go, you feel you're part of a community, you have wonderful food, and there'll be other things there just other than food. So I think that you can go to any kind of product and you'll see this evolution. The same, now I have it in the bottom here, for money. First, again, we're in the tribe, we're just trading. Later, we have some shells. Unit of currency is invented that has a lot of utility. In fact, eventually, we have an established currency that works around the, the world, gold and silver. Somebody invented the bank because it was really dangerous to carry that around with you wherever you went. So the bank becomes incredibly important and incredibly powerful when it was invented. It was the Templars that probably invented it, a, a church, of course. Um, and then we had the plurality of banks. And this is, I think, where we are today. We have several banks, and I just put some down here. But we can already see that there is a little bit of something more. If you look at Insha, if you look at Tomorrow, if you look at Penta, if you look at First, if you look at N26, functionally, are they really like any established incumbent bank has more functionality. 
The people that go to N26, it's even the slogan, banking by design. So which kind of people choose that bank, and why do they choose that bank, and what kind of features does this bank have to have in order to keep that customer for, 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 uh, in their journey? And if you want to say, where does it go? You can just go to American uh, Express Black. That's the card for, I'm better than you. Yeah? So if I pull that out, I immediately say, I have a lot of money, I'm very rich, and I can afford anything. And um, so we are getting into this where it's not just about status, but it also says something about who I am. And I think that this is much more likely to be the reality that we are going to be developing in. If, if that is the reality, that means that, that there's going to be a plurality of different brands of banks, there's a few things. First of all, the bank infrastructure will always be there, so banks won't go away. First of all, they provide some of the piping and they provide the lending, and uh, no matter what the brand is, that will have to continue to be there. Messaging will matter much more than ever. What's the ban bank for me? A young teenager today does not say, oh, I want to go to Sparkasse, or I want to go to DKB, or the, like this. They're more like thinking, oh, what bank does fit my image? Who am I banking with? You know, in this case, you know, you could say maybe WhatsApp could develop into, into a bank. It would be quite possible. So in a way, the, the banks won't go away because the infrastructure is important. And so any bank that has more than one million customers, the irrelevant of the brand, has enough, we, we believe, enough customers to do the balance sheet game and the balance sheet uh, business model. And that's how they will survive. The one thing that is, is functionality will become a commodity, right? Uh, and brand will become the reality. So, let's see maybe one example where something similar has happened um, in a second. And I also want to say what motivates some of this drive, and I have just have the numbers of N26 and Revolut, a little bit of what we see. Um, I think that none of this would have had to happen. None of this evolution of tomorrow, of Incha, and all the other challenger banks that are coming on the market would have to happen if it wasn't for these two brands. I think they're waking up, so we have, <laughs> we have the banks calling us saying, oh, we'd like to do something more with data, we'd like to better serve our customers, we'd have to have lower, lower churn, and we're in some uh, degree afraid of what N26 and Revolut are doing. And they're right to be a little bit afraid. Um, because that, that's what's driving the innovation forward, and I think that's what's actually motivating the change. Right, and so in this game, the banks, what we do see is that they're building more functionality either into the apps that they have, or they're actually starting to clone brands or bring other similar challenger brands to the market, so to challenge the challengers. First is a good example of that by Deutsche Bank, which is... Uh, maybe, you know, inspired by Penta, if you could say it like so. Um, this has happened before, so I'm going to talk about beer. It's a bit early for that, but uh, it, beer, in the beer market, and when I was a little kid and I walked into the beer to buy some beer for my dad, there were five, six different beer brands in the, in the supermarket, and you picked the ones that you wanted, and, you know, that's it. That was your choice, the, the, the manufacturers. Today, this is a, a picture of all the beers they are. Um, but you can see that of all of these beer brands, they're owned by roughly four companies. So, in the sense, what I'm trying to get to is, or I'm trying to communicate to you is, there can still just be four banks, but there will be many, many more brands. And each of these brands has a brand promise, and it has to keep that promise, and it's usually not just we keep your money. So it's going to be the bank, we keep your money, and whatever else, additional thing that is that that bank does. Insha, let, Insha lets you find the closest mosque. Penta is integrated with accounting software. Tomorrow we'll plant trees, right? So it's, it's banking plus. So what, what we see is that there will be better targeting from big, from big banks for the customers and probably additional brands. You'll have niche banks. In a little bit of a while, I think there'll be consolidation in the space so that actually the big players will own them all again. And uh, the, re the, the solution to that uh, facet is it's a bank plus, right? Uh, one last word about what we do. 
we actually are a platform that enables this change. Uh, we help banks uh, build new products into their existing apps or entirely new brands of apps. That's what we do. And we build an, a, an extreme advantage by looking at the data of the customer. So what we've learned is that if we can understand what's going on, if this person is getting married, if they're having a child, if they're buying a house, if they're getting a car, might give you an idea of what's going on in their life. And based on that, you can build the plus in the bank. And that's what Azure does. Uh, we are live. And if you want to talk to me a little bit later, I can show you what I mean. And it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And that's what I think we'll have in the future. We'll have lots more brands. Banks are not irrelevant, but there'll be much more in the background. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Now we're very curious what Jana will share with us. Thank you so much. I won't um, show you a presentation because I think it's much more interesting to focus face on face, basically. Otherwise, you'll have always to look at the back. So um, we've heard a lot uh, about how the fintech um, developed and what position banks are. Um, also, there is the saying, banking is necessary, banks are not. Um, a lot of people are saying that banks don't move forward, they are not agile, they aren't doing anything. So um, I just wanted to give you some of my explanation what's going on right now and why something has happened or not happening. Um, well, we've, we've heard um, that fintechs are coming up and we've seen that a lot of fintechs went into niche um, things and kind of like focused on front ends and kind of like tried to develop a better bank, but then also decided like to go on the B2C market and noticed that marketing expenditure was way too high. So then they moved forward to like B to B to C markets and cooperated with banks. Banks at that moment weren't as scared as in the beginning when fintechs popped up. So they know that they have to do something. I think they are not as scared anymore, but still like people are wondering why aren't they moving faster? Is everything up for the fintechs or can banks actually do something. And with respect to the topic of German angst, I were thinking about what kind of angst do actually banks have right now? Well, I have two hypotheses that I want to share with you guys and see what you think. The first one is regulation and the security of data that banks have to provide. So historically, banks were always the ones that had, to, that had to secure the customer data, that you have the um, bankgeheimnis, the, the security um, that they historically had to save. So actually opening up data, actually doing something with data is really scary for banks. Why? Because trust is the most crucial asset that a bank has, also in comparison to uh, technology companies, to fintech. So actually going into that risk, doing something with their data, first of all, is scary. However, we've seen a lot of companies doing something with data. And I'm not quite sure if a bank needs to have necessarily the best um, let's say like status. I agree that status is important, but for me giving up my data is mostly about having convenience, doing something and getting something back. And that's, I think, a reason why people are giving up data for other services. And I'm convinced that right now banks are still kind of like concerned giving up their data, but as soon as they have a promising um, added value for the customers, they will move forward. But that's a slower process than for fintechs because fintechs can actually try out new things. And that's also my, like, Coming to my second hypothesis, banks are mostly with their self-image. Um, it's more like a service company rather than a technology company. What do I mean by that? I mean, a technology company for me 
invest in infrastructure a huge amount has the best infrastructure doesn't care about if it's in a cloud or not um, but they want to move on faster they want to try out new things they actually can fail and not lose their image and try out new things so their pace is way faster than with a traditional bank so for your bank it's more focused on service service is kind of like, again, giving people trust, kind of like their self-image of just being like a financial institution and not anything else. We've heard with the first um, part of Jeroen focusing on financial services, focusing on banking. I think what's important is opening up that thought of banks just providing banking solutions. There is much more that a bank can do with the assets that they have, with the trust of the customer. Why not use data to open up new business models, new convenience of like, oh, hey, I'm um, booking my, my um, airplane. I know that this customer is really... Um, conscious concerning the environment then also he likes to go skiing why not offer like this perfect trip with like everything he needs by analyzing transaction data by analyzing bills etc of course just if the customer agrees to it and the customer has transparency of what the data is actually used for so i think these two hypotheses um and then of oh, Maybe one more thing to add, um, it's not that a company or a, um, a banking industry is not moving forward with a technological aspect. For example, at Comdirect, we're moving forward to a private cloud to be more agile and also to have like a better infrastructure, an IT infrastructure that allows us to act more like a tech company. Also, there are more um, technologies that we are trying out, but not just with our customers, mostly with either fintechs or with institutes like Fraunhofer going into AI, going into blockchain. So there is a shift and also banks are moving forward, trying out new things, but on a different, like a, like a safer ground um, rather than implementing it right away. So what will the future hold? I think there are two models and um, the last uh, session that we had, we heard it's like a sprint. Uh, what banks have to do right now. I think there are two models that are more like a, like a marathon. Maybe you can com like compare it to like an Ironman and maybe Tour de France. Um, so two models that we have there. The first one is going into like just being like an infrastructure provider. Infrastructure provider means that you have to be really efficient and banks are getting more efficient. They use RPA, they use um, machine learning, etc., to make things more efficient. But maybe like as an infrastructure, you could just be like in the back end. You don't have any kind of front end. You let other people interact with the customers and you provide like really sufficient back ends. That might be one solution because it's basically just economies of scale right now, if you just consider it as a banking service. Um, but you have to be the first. You have to be the first and you have to be really efficient to be like an infrastructure provider. And that's the first part. On the other hand, you could also try to be a really smart financial assistant. Smart financial assistant for me is providing banking services, but also providing any kind of added value to the customer that they treasure. And maybe that's a service a la carte. It's not just like a standard portfolio, but different services that you can bind as a, uh, as a customer. But as a smart financial assistant, giving overview of all your financials, not just like a current account, but also what kind of houses do you own? What kind of valuables do you have? Maybe just showing everything. Um, that also implies that you have to be at the front end, that you have to interact with the customer in order to actually give them the innovation to provide value, to um, interact with the customer. That's crucial. And so you have these both models, being an infrastructure or being like the smart financial assistant, and it's really hard to actually find your way what kind of thing you want to do, but because so far banks are not that fast yet, and I think there's also possibility that maybe a couple of other actors could come into the market and take over the roles, but I I'm convinced that banks have the potential to fulfill both roles, but they have to move and they have to move fast. 
Thank you so much. Moving fast is the stichwort, ah, English, moving fast. Now we move back, we huddle back onto the center of the stage, please. At least oh. you three with the chairs. Playing a bit of musical chairs. And um, great, thank you for your presentation. I think there's a lot um, that we um, would want to discuss. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you all like set? I see. Uh. <laughs> um, one question to Jana. Um, you mentioned smart digital assistants as one option where retail banks and uh, can go besides in, or banks can go besides infrastructure provider. Uh, what about the competition in this field uh, in future? You already mentioned some other players might enter the market. Yeah. Uh, if we talk about uh, big techs, which we have heard before, that's probably one of the areas because they already collect a lot of data. If they enter the financial services markets, then this field is probably one of those that they will certainly and uh, I would, that would be my um, uh, prediction. A, do you agree with this? And B, uh, would it be a wise step of a bank then to choose that new business or that type of future business model? Many questions. So, um, first of all, yes, of course, we have the big techs, and usually everybody is talking about GAFA, so the American um, big techs. I think you also have to consider um, the Chinese companies, so Baidu, Tencent, Alibaba, etc., um, because they are actually moving quite fast as well, and usually they are not on the radar of uh, a lot of people and just focusing on Facebook, uh, etc. So, um, yeah, definitely, they can enter the market because they already have the front end and they have the customer uh, interaction, so definitely. Um, is it still wise for a company or for a bank to focus on a smart financial assistant? Yes, I think um, banks have to move and I think that's a service that they can provide and I think you you have to um, comply with the, with the regulatory things. Um, banks have the knowledge, they have the capability to do that. Um, and right now, with the low interest rates, it's not necessarily uh, the best area for other, others um, to enter. They focus right now a lot of like stuff on on payments because it's basically just sending like a message in like a Facebook Messenger. It doesn't matter if it's like a payment or if it's a message. Um, but there is much more to banking than just payments, um, and I think banks should not just put banking service in the middle of everything. The banking itself is not like a self-purpose. Usually, it's a tr trading a good within a context and you have to have like the context and put like banking as one vehicle into that um, and so if you just focus on banking as like separate from interacting and like the surrounding that's bad so if you want to still exist in the future i think you have to put banking embedded into a context of other things and i think banks can do that as well as big techs yeah, I, I just maybe one comment on that. So I, a, a secret wish of mine is to be able to pitch Apple um, and Google on the idea that you'd put the bank basically on an infrastructure layer the same as like graphics, right? And if they did that, then every app could directly interact with your, I mean, it would be very bad news for banks, but <laughs> directly. So I, I was at Money 2020 and I talked to a guy from Google about that um, and he, he indicated that they are working on it. So um, I think we're going to see that, but I don't, I think then it's going to be you no know, like Apple does it piece by piece by piece and I think the context is really important. I agree with you. Yeah. Tyrone, any? Um, I, I question whether banks have the advantage of offering a strong front end, whether they can compete with the big techs, whether the, the uh, early pace of this world. Um, what we've seen with the rise of fintech, it's, uh, and also the challenger banks really, it's, it's, they come in with a very strong proposition. That's where they win customers. Um, and just more tailored to, to the customer, fancy, etc. Um, what you see nowadays uh, is also with the open banking area, basically every self-respected bank wants to be like the go-to platform in open banking. Uh, 
But you can question yourself, is that sustainable? Can they really compete at, at that level? And there I have my questions in the, in the long term. Obviously, there's a very important topic called cybersecurity. And we do see tweets from time to time from digital challenger banks. I don't want to name any. Sorry, we're offline for the moment. And two hours later, oh, we're back and so on. Also, some uh, online banks in Germany have this topic from time to time. Um, so if we see this uh, sort of happening more often simply because more people do uh, banking online and so on, uh, trust building will be even more difficult for fintech startups in, in the first place, but also for the banks to keep up the trust level. Um, do you, first of all, do you agree with that uh, point of view? And follow-up question, would it be another business model for a bank to simply go back and just be a manager of regulation, basically just run the identification, for example, and sell this as a service? That's what I would add to your slide that yes. you had on your... Yes, I totally uh, agree. One of the core aspects of banks is to have trust. If you if you have these comparisons, uh, where do you want to put your money? Uh, you have all these comparisons with Google, etc. And then your own bank, it's still your own bank that you trust with your money. And that's something that banks can leverage. Um, I question in what way, but that's definitely, definitely something that separates them from the fancy fintechs that are bold and just go there without first thinking, is this compliant? Is this actually safe and secure? So I agree with that point, yes. Yeah, I also think it's going to get a lot worse, right? Like in the open banking world, you're going to have a chain of different uh, value, well, a transaction chain where maybe the interface you're using and then the thing in the middle and then the other thing in yeah. the middle and then the bank and it, it, it messes up somewhere along that chain, right? And I don't think as an industry we have figured out who's responsible. Um, it's for us like an, an issue because sometimes, you know, when we're thinking of concepts and building with concepts with, with banks, because that's what we do, uh, we, we, we help banks challenge the challengers, we, we, we say, okay, well, if we put this all together and it maybe isn't the bank that's messing up and it's maybe not us that's messing up, it's some component in the middle. Simply, if your card doesn't work at the ATM, it could be the ATM's fault. Simple example like that. Then who, who do they call and who do they blame? They always, in the end, blame the, the interface that they see, right? And I think that is, in this open world, uh, still a very unsolved problem. Yeah. And I think somewhere where the bank can provide an incredible amount of value by giving the whole chain some trust and the, the, the feeling that somebody is caring for this. Yeah, well, to, to add to my previous point and building on what you're saying, it's, it's really the role of the secure infrastructure provider uh, with some stamp on it, it's safe, and then, of course, in the back end, ensuring that it's safe. That's the role that they can certainly take then. Definitely agree. Um, as I also said, I think the, the huge asset that a bank has is the trust. Um, I think also in the future, if we look at blockchain, etc., a bank has to find a way to position themselves um, if that's coming um, and if the landscape therefore is changed. But I think um, that's an aspect that bank can fulfill because they already have the um, competence to do so. And also with the, the, with the chain that you just described, I think it's a huge chance for somebody pr to position themselves um, at the front end and not just saying like, oh, it's not my fault. Maybe you should call, I don't know, like this card provider or you should call this guy. And then you have like three or four people that you have to call. Um, but if you combine all the services, everything that's on the market and you just have the front end and one person that um, cares for you and that solves your problems and um, maybe it tells you like, I'll just call you back in five minutes and everything is solved. Mm -hmm. That's something that provides added value that's convenience for the customer and that's where my vision goes um, for it for the banks. I liked a lot, Philip, uh, what you said about uh, the, the example with the beer. Not because I like beer, I prefer red wine, <laughs> but um, the number of brands going to uh, jump up. Um, there are in London, you see this coming. Uh, probably there will be future announcements soon, smaller target groups, very dedicated challenger banks going uh, after that. So I 
fully believe that. But what is your view how the competition landscape in Germany slash Europe is going to look like in 10 years' time? I mean, you mentioned money 2020. Um, that's next year, let's say 2030. Well, how does the German banking market look like in terms of competition? So I think that the, to synthesize what we just said, I think if you look at cars, it's, it's like that. I think that the role of a car maker, they buy the, this component from Bosch and the, this, the engine from over there and the brakes from over there, and then they guarantee it works. And if it doesn't work, you know, then we all see what happens. But let's say you know, then it's an Audi, it's a Volkswagen, it's a Mercedes. And I think in that department where the trust is on that level, I think the banks will be there. But it'll be uh, this service powered by... Uh, Comdirect, this power, you know, this service powered by DKB, where they take ownership of the different components, and I think that's the, at least the medium term. And, and and on the periphery, you'll get a lot of, you'll get a lot of uh, niche banks or bank plus products. Um, that's one. So that 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 exists, and I think that'll continue. Um, what I what I really don't have a good answer, and maybe I'd like to your view is like if Apple. <laughs> Uh, and they're already starting with a mm. the card, right? They're already sitting between bank and uh, merchant. Um, and if they're going to, say, provide an account and they provide some lending products, uh, and they have a TV channel that they are now making, it's a, and an iTunes store, and, and you can just imagine the power of that brand targeting you, not just at the phone, but with culture, with music, uh, with the device that's with you at all times. In, 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 in this area, I don't know whether Apple will actually go all the way to bank or whether also seek to find partners or Google will find partners and say, okay, we work together and, and let go forward. But that, that part I don't, I don't yet know. Maybe I can add a couple of things. Um, I believe that, yeah, there might be some more fintechs popping up and more banks, but ultimately for the next 10 years, I think that's more like a consolidation. I don't believe that there will be even more banks coming up um, and just survive for the next 10 years. Um, I think it's more um, internationalized, so you will find a huge couple of banks within the European area. Why? Because of regulations. I don't think that you have like a bank that covers every area, but everywhere where the regulation is pretty similar, I think you have a couple of huge players um, and not a diverse portfolio. And then also then they, and with that part, I completely agree, it's kind of like service a la carte. You have a bank, you have different services, and you'll just take them. That, that's my personal view. Yeah, maybe adding on what you're, what you're saying, I think overall what we see is a more diversified landscape more different type of players um, i think also the banks will exist as they are today but it's more like a gradual change they bit by bit they, they have a smaller share of the financial service market i believe they're different type of players the challenge in banks the big tax um, all sorts of players taking new sorts of roles as you uh, as you sketch um, i don't think it's a big boom suddenly, uh, except for some specific banks or niches, but overall they're on the decline in what you see nowadays in Germany, I think already with the Sparkas and with the Deutsche Bank, Commerzbank. Um, they're not sustainable with the money that they're making. They're just barely surviving. That's what I think you see more and more and new players are coming up, taking over their part. And maybe just one more thing to add to that. When we uh, talk about uh, competition and plays, we focused on big tech, we focused on banks and fintechs. Maybe one aspect that we also have to um, regard is like look at Check24, Check24. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that are also um, having huge potential to actually develop even more um, within the financial industry. And I think we have to look out for them as well. Another question uh, to you, actually, Jana. Philip said uh, experience uh, restaurants is sort of uh, what he's seeing also coming into the banking world. So experience banking. Uh, tell us a little bit. I mean, we're alone here, nobody there. Uh, what Comdirect <laughs> is basically cooking uh, in, in, in this direction? Any, any secrets you can share with us? What to expect? I'm sure Ex there are some Comdirect clients uh, in the audience mm. with, with yeah sure right <laughs> um with experience i mean 
first of all, Comdirect is focused on uh, trading. We're full bank, but we're focused on trading. So what we are um, aiming at is having like a platform where we also provide different services um, with our trading API that we just launched. Um, so trading is for us the forefront and we also for example integrate ourselves into the day-to-day -day business of customers um, for example with um, online shopping um, when you go online shopping uh, we get like an affiliate um, pr provision i guess um, and then we'll put that right into the account of the customers. So kind of like integrating into like a new contextual area that it's not just like trading, but trading with a context as well. Um, and that's things that we are going to focus more in the future as well. Thank you. Um, with one of the founders that we uh, work with, uh, a European founder, don't mention the, the country now, he shared with me a few years ago his vision uh, of the Bank of the Future. And he said, uh, in his view, the Bank of the Future will uh, consist of two employees, the CEO and the CTO, <laughs> basically. And they go for lunch and then basically decide which APAs uh, to switch on, switch off, um, uh, you know, for the next, uh, in the next months and so on. Is that something that uh, you can imagine? somehow happening maybe not now but in 2030 mm. not, not not really I, I don't know if you I, I'll no. just I'll just start and um, if, if you look at Solaris Bank usually you have like every module to build a bank in the background and everything is provided for you but then to actually make a difference because everybody can access these resources and you don't differentiate yourself from the market. So I think you need to have more people with more creativity um, shaping the, f um, like the, the, the front end, shaping the, the, um, the segments around it and not just using the same stuff all day long. Like. Um, so I think every time that you come up with something new, you need creativity and building on something new and destroy something and build something up um, again. So I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. And also, even if somebody says, okay, just two, I would at least um, add the, you got the guy that's responsible for UI or UX, um, because I think that's, that's very valuable. I'd add the chief marketing officer. So we had four. <laughs> so, <see>? um, so <laughs> Well, what I would add to that, it really depends on what's your future bank. What does it look like and what capabilities does it need? I think it assure, assumes sort of you have a business manager, an IT guy. And I think it's valid that nowadays everyone expects some CTO guy, IT guy in, in, in the board, right? Uh, but I agree for many roles, if you take the front end or such, you need marketing, you need user experience. And first of all, you need more people than just two. But, but in short, it really depends on what sort of business you're building and then based on the day you determine the roles. To be fair, the guy who told me he was the co-founder, he was the CTO, so he probably didn't <laughs> think so much about marketing and, yeah. and UI. And or stuff. finance or such, you may need as well, you know? Well, that's the CEO's role. Um, yeah. Who will, if we look at um, the market as it is now, who will, there, there's obviously disruption somehow at the horizon here and there. Who will disrupt most? Will it be the fintech startups like uh, Azure? Will it be the big techs? Will it be the regulators, PSD2, or will it be the banks themselves? I mean, we see a trend now, um, <coughs> ETFs going down to zero basis points, brokerage fees going down uh, to zero partially. Um, so banks are also playing uh, in this. Who's going to be the biggest disruptor? I, I think fintechs are doing it nowadays. They are really setting the benchmark for, for banks and forcing them to, to go along. And it's not like a big bang di disruption, but it's happening every day, every day a little bit. And if you look back, it's a big change. So that's a big di disruption. And if you look at like the sun and big change, my big question mark, and I don't know the answer, I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts, but it's the GAFAs and also the players from, from Asia. My idea is in Europe, these platforms take a different role or they, they cannot fit in the same way, but they potentially can have a big impact on the market where you flick with your eyes and suddenly, boom, it's changed quite dramatically. 
Yeah, I think from a, from a fintech perspective, disrupting the market is very expensive if you want to go directly to the consumer. That's definitely something we thought about at the very beginning is to just go directly to the consumer and try to disrupt the market from that, from that place. But uh, what you'll find there that the people that decide whether you can do that or not are basically the venture capital arms because that, those are the people who give you the money and you just have to no look at what about Revolut and, and, and N26 and, and, and Moniz and uh, all the others have had to raise in order to get to a significant market share. Um, so from our perspective, we, we want to disrupt the market together with a, with a player, with a bank that already has a customer base, that already has the trust and they have an asset they can leverage. So that's, how, that, that's the conclusion we came to. Um, it's nicer to the investors because they don't need to be diluted into the ground. And at the same time, you can have a very significant impact if you find the right partner to play with, especially if there is a level of trust and also uh, culture in the two organizations. And, and we've, we've had success there in the past. Um, so from my perspective, is it, at the, the, the players that are out there and the new ones that will come will disrupt the market if they can have access to capital. Um, and for me, it is really like if, if, if one of the um, big technology companies decides to really go all the way native to the bank account, I think that'll have the, the biggest impact. And in that case, they'll, they'll have to work with the bank to just get the trust. But I think that's where the, the disruption could be the most immense in one device. I think also it depends on how far it goes the impact. So for example, if you look at fintechs, I think they come up with new ideas, um, but then they usually, if they are having a really cool idea, they're usually acquired by a bank or another player. So, and then if they are getting acquired by another player, then they have like the exposure to way more people um, than just doing it themselves. That, that's at least what I think. Um, or you get like a really cool VC and they'll just spend everything on marketing and can scale up really quickly. But usually a lot of people um, might get bought by another bigger player. Then for um, banks, I think they, they have to move and they will move. Um, but also considering regulatory aspects, every time you get a new legislation or something that kind of like constrains you, you have to get more creative. and by uh, having these constraints, people have to come up with new ideas. They have to push themselves forward. So I think also regulation kind of like s accelerates that as well. Um, and then, of course, like if you consider big techs, they can try out new things and they already have the capital. Um, let's say like you just mentioned um, zero commission trading. Of course, Robin Hood was already like really cool, but just imagine like JP Morgan spending like every year 150 uh, billion euros or something or mi million years um, on doing like zero trade commissioning um, as just depreciation. And what, what will happen to the market then? And you're talking about the bank. So a bank with capital. Um, I mean, there are different aspects and I think they're all playing together and we'll see how the game will end. And is a good point. We are almost mm. done, I think. But um, are there questions from the audience? Come on, somebody break the ice. Please mm. go ahead. Hello, my name is Naomi. Uh, I'm curious, what do you think? Uh, how would the Treasury Department uh, will shift and who will own it besides the bank within the next five years? The Treasury Department? Yeah, because I think that that's the most important current asset of banks, and that's what result in our trust in banks. So I was wondering if you yeah. think that other entities will be able to hold it as well. No, uh, I think um, Treasury or financing risk is sort of the, the core activity of a bank, right? Eh? Uh, attracting deposits, lending it, and managing the risk and such. Um, in that sense, it's certainly a core that's the most immune to, to change, but also there I think banks must change. Yeah, you have alternative lenders with new processes using new technology, big data, etc. Something more efficient, able to 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 um, to uh, yeah lend in better conditions and such. You have uh, companies like Raisin offering platforms for deposits and such. So also there, there are things are changing, and also in the treasury department, banks must move forward as well. I think. I, th I think I can give you a bit of an insight. I'm we are currently at F10, which is an accelerator 
of fintechs, and I think there are at least two or three startups there that are uh, dealing with optimizing the treasury department. So th there's innovation there on getting the loans off the book or basically sharing the risk. And But you're absolutely right, that's where the culture is set. And I think that's uh, one of the issues of why they're not moving fast enough is because it's the treasury department is the core earning the heart of the bank. And um, that is a risk averse entity by, by design. So um, I think that's one of the, the issues of uh, why they're not why banks are not moving fast enough because those are the decision makers on a, in a big scale as well. I agree. I think it, it's it's a service that a bank has to offer, and it's at at the core as well. Um, but it's not the only thing that a bank can do, and I think that's important. There is much more to a bank than just treasury. I think. Any more questions? If that's not the case, then my last question to you. Very easy, not yes or no, but one or the other answer. Pretty digital, actually. actually. Who Will a big tech rather buy an existing banking player, or will a bank rather buy a big tech? Should I start? Yes. <laughs> I think um, a big tech will buy a bank. I don't think they'll buy a bank. They'll cooperate with a bank and or build their own. Well, first of all, I don't see banks buying a big tech because I don't <laughs> see any bank having the capital to, to be able to do that. That's not cheap even, at the moment. Not even the largest banks. Um, and then the question is, will they buy, will the big techs uh, buy a bank or build something? They may buy some very small financial service providers just to get the regulatory compliance if it's a good business case uh, over building something. But that's the only thing what I see. I don't see big techs buying big banks. If they do, maybe very small banks. Okay, very last question, just jumped on my mind. Uh, would you, I mean, we do see obviously a lot of uh, GAFAs, America and so on. There's a data issue. We are in Germany, data protection is very important. <laughs> I think it's time for some type of European uh, Facebook, European Amazon and so on. Could banks go behind something like this and initiate this? I don't see it. I, 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 if you look at the who, fi it, it's again who finances it, and at what stage. So as a startup, you know you have to get your angel investment, and you have to get to your seed round, and the blah blah. You have to, basically you go through all of that, right? And uh, what I see from where we sit as an as an entrepreneur, the people that have the the cojones to actually carry a company through. Are where does the money come from? It very rarely comes from Central Europe, which is why these companies are not here. It's culturally like once we're in Series B, C, D, then you know VCs are in this in, in this geography are very happy, but seed investments are very small. So I, if if venture capital arms, which are much more pro risk, are not doing it at at scale in Central Europe, but actually the money is coming from somewhere else outside then I don't think it's that it couldn't happen because we can't do it, but we're just culturally a bit too scared of taking that leap. And I think banks would be also, uh, that's why I don't see it. Yeah, to, to add to that two points, first of all, I don't see banks at all doing something like that, or maybe if they do in some countries, to me it doesn't make sense. That's not where their core strength is. And second is, we talk about Europe, but unlike America or China, which are more homogeneous countries or markets, there's not one Europe, really. Uh, I'm Dutch, you're German. That's already a culture, what we do, or difference in culture, let alone whole of Europe. So also there are sea challenges. I, I wouldn't say that they are building Facebook. I don't think that they are doing like a copycat of something that's already uh, existent. But I think that they could form a platform that provides something that is not served so far. And that could spread over Europe, yeah. um, that could, as I mentioned earlier, that could be like an aggregated form of all your finances plus added values that I completely can imagine. And that is a platform. Um, and then you could also say uh, Facebook is a platform, but I would not build a copycat to Facebook or maybe like a copycat to things that you see in Asia. But I think there are certain aspects that a bank can form and build. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Schönes Schlusswort. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you for your time. Please give a big hand to our panelists. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks. It was a pleasure. <laughs>